Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honoured to introduce our first keynote speaker of the conference, Dr. Mordecai Paldiel. Dr. Paldiel is the former director of the Department of the Righteous at Yad Vashem, a member of the board of directors at Susan Mendes Foundation and a lecturer at Yeshiva University. He was born in Belgium and during the war, he and his family fled to France where they were aided by a Catholic priest who smuggled the entire family across into Switzerland. Dr. Paldiel is a leading authority on the rescue during the Holocaust and has written an extensive number of books on the subject. So without further ado, please help me in welcoming Dr. Mordecai Paldiel. Thank you. I don't need this. Do I need this? No. Okay, good morning and uh, welcome. I would like to start by uh, first uh, thanking the Pilecki Institute for inviting me uh, to this important conference. I will speak of an amazing and unique rescue operation involving a group of Polish diplomats and Jewish uh, rescue activists, a story that only recently came to light. After the fall of Poland at the start of World War II, some Polish uh, diplomatic officers in other countries remained open and continued to function. In Switzerland, since May 1940, the Swiss legation in Bern was headed by Alexander Wadosz, an experienced diplomatic career officer. When he took up the post as officially chargé d'affaires, two other diplomats already worked there, Stefan Rinievich and Konstanty Rokitsky. Another staff of the Jewish, Julius Kuhl, originally from Poland, was made responsible for Polish Jewish refugees in Switzerland. At about that time, Foreign Minister August Zaleski and the Polish government in exile instructed Polish uh, diplomats to recognize the validity of Polish passports held by persons whose term had expired. Starting in April 1940, the Polish consulate in Bern began to reconfirm the passports that had lapsed, and this included many Polish Jews who had fled from France to Switzerland and entered it illegally, thus helping them to remain in Switzerland with the Polish consulate, sharing in the cost of their upkeep in the detention camps where they were kept. This, incidentally, including myself and my family, after we fled from France in September 1943. By the end of 1944, there were approximately 6,000 such people in Switzerland in around 70 refugee camps. The other major rescue milestone by the Polish legation is linked with the false Latin American passport scheme. It began after the Russian occupation of Eastern Poland in September 1939, when dozens of Paraguayan documents were obtained from Rudolf Hugli the Paraguayan consul in Bern, in which the names of Polish Jews were entered and properly sealed that enabled some of them to escape to Japan. There, they were given proper Polish passport by the Polish consul, Tadeusz Romer, with which they proceeded to other destinations. Passports were also obtained from diplomats in Switzerland representing the Latin American countries such as Peru, Honduras, Costa Rica, as well as Haiti, but mostly from the Paraguayan chargé d'affaires, Rudolf Hugli, and all such transactions in return against payment. Payment to the Latin American diplomats. These papers protest, protected their holders from deportation to extermination camps. Instead, they were sent to internment camps in Germany and occupied France, in the Nazi hope to exchange them for Germans living in Latin American countries. That was the idea. This work was coordinated with two main Jewish rescue activists, both stationed in Switzerland with Abraham Zilberstein, head of a subsidiary of the World Jewish Congress, dealing with rescue and known as Relico, and Chaim Israel Eis, I should say Rabbi Eis, of the Orthodox Agudat Israel movement. 
Yitzchak and Recha Sternbuch, who represented the New York-based rescue commission known as Vadat Salah, also played a role in this vast rescue op operation. In his statement before the Swiss police on September 1, 1943, Abraham Zilberschein told that in mid-1943, he met at the Polish legation with First Secretary Stefan Rinievich and Konstanty Rokitsky of the consular section, who both asked him to help them obtain South American passports from the Latin American diplomatic representative in Switzerland, and thus save the recipients from harm by the Germans. Zilberschein obtained most of the passports from Rudolf Hügli, the Paraguayan honorary consul, in return for payment. Then turned them over to Konstanty Rokitsky, who together with Rinievich and Kühl inserted the names and personal information of Polish Jews, whose names were earlier received from Zilberschein or Rabbi Eis. These were then returned to Zilberschein, who delivered them back to Hugli, who added the signature and the official Paraguayan seal, thus making these passports legal. Zilberschein photocopied the original passports, which he kept to himself, the original, and sent photocopies to the persons concerned, all Polish citizens, and living either in Poland or other German-dominated countries, such as the Netherlands, Belgium, Slovakia, and Hungary, in addition, citizenship papers of Paraguay, known as promesas, were also sent to Polish Jews living in German-dominated countries to prevent their deportation to concentration camps. The turning of Polish citizens into Paraguayan ones was done secretly without the knowledge of the Paraguayan government, who later, upon revelation, dismissed Hugli as its diplomatic representative in Bern. It was also done without the prior approval of the Polish government in exile in London, although it consented to it later when it learned of the initiative that Wadosh had taken of this highly unorthodox diplomatic action that risked complicating relations between Poland and the Latin American countries. In his statement before the Swiss police, Zilberschein emphasized that in this work, he did so in full cooperation with the Polish diplomatic authorities in Switzerland. One cannot therefore imagine that Rinievich and Grokiski would have invited Zilberschein to collaborate with them in this vast false passport scheme without the approval of the man in charge of the Polish legation, Alexander Wadosz. As evidenced in deal by Julius Kuhl before the Swiss police, when they discovered the false passport scheme, he stated that the passport's operation was fully carried out with the knowledge of our envoy, Herr Minister Alexander Ladosch, as Kuhl stated in German. Diese Tätigkeit würde wollendes mit Wissen unserer Gesandten, Herr Minister Alexander Ladosch, ausgeübt. In some cases, Fully legal Polish passports were also issued to non-Polish Jews in the interest of their safety, such as the Polish passport issued to the German Jewish Dr. Josef Burg, a leading official of the Palestine Jewish Agency and later an important minister in the Israeli government, who had come to Switzerland from Palestine to attend the Zionist conference in August 1939 and was prevented from returning to Palestine due to the outbreak of the war. He obtained a Polish passport and was thus able to leave via France in 1940 before that country's fall to Germany. In addition, the French Jewish socialist politician Pierre Mendes France, later Prime Minister of France, who had escaped from a pro-German Vichy jail in France and remained secluded in Geneva. He also obtained a Polish passport under the false name of Jan Lebenberg, with which he secretly made his way via Vichy France and Spain and Portugal, from where he proceeded to England and joined the Free French Forces organized by General Charles de Gaulle. When Wadosz learned that the Germans were questioning the validity of the Latin American passports in possession of mostly Polish Jews, 
who were temporarily held by the Germans in the Vittel camp in occupied France. On December 19, 1943, Wadosh dispatched an urgent message to Tadeusz Romer, who was now serving as the Polish foreign minister in London, pleading, and I quote, I kindly ask you, Mr. Minister, to vig vigorously intervene with all the relevant governments, England, the United States, Paraguay, Honduras, Peru, Ecuador, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Nicaragua, Chile, Haiti, Venezuela, and with the Pan-American Union, so that the legations representing their interests in Berlin will recognize all passports issued solely for humanitarian purposes in order to save people from certain death. The matter is very urgent, end quote. He followed this up on January 4, 1944, with an additional message to his own government, in which he clearly admitted the Burns Legation Initiative in this undertaking, a role not previously known to his superiors in London. In his words, the issue of obtaining passports of Latin American countries for Polish Jews in order to save them from being sent to the so-called extermination camps was indeed timely. And indeed, a number of people were saved in this way and directed to the internment camps. Unfortunately, in the meantime, serious complications emerged in this case, leading to challenging the validity of the previously issued documents. At the moment, they are now under threat of deportations. In this case, the legation has already asked the ministry for assistance in intervention. Wadash continued to press this issue, and in a month later, on February 24, 1944, he wrote to Dr. Karl Burkhardt of the International Committee of the Red Cross in Geneva for that organization's intervention to save the detained Jews. After Paraguay, Peru, Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Chile, under American pressure, had revalidated the false passports and their country's names. Another important mechanism to which the Polish legation in Bern, under the leadership of Wadders, was of immense help to Jews, both in Switzerland and abroad, was the use of its special radio station to transmit secret messages on the situation of Jews in German-occupied countries. The Swiss authorities had warned the Poles that this constituted a violation of Swiss wartime laws. But Wadosh continued to operate the radio station. With the help of the secret transmitter, soon news of the German atrocities began to arrive in the West in quick successions. As reported by David Kelly, head of the British legation in Switzerland, in a letter dated November 19, 1941, to his colleagues in the Foreign Office, he says, the Paul told me that one and a half million Jews living in Eastern, recently Russian Poland, have simply disappeared altogether. Nobody knows how and where. In the words of historian Walter Lacour, it is one of the first, if not the very first, indication that the activities of the Einsatzgruppen had reached the West, and also the fact that hundreds of thousands of Jews had been killed. The source was Alexander Wadosh, the Polish diplomatic representative in Bern. Yitzhak and Recha Sternbuch of the Wada Zala Rescue Office in Switzerland made much use of the secret Polish transmitter with permission of Alexander Wadosh to transmit messages to their rescue colleagues in the United States via the New York Polish Consulate. Isaac Levine, the link person between the New York Polish Consulate and Jewish organizations, relates that telegrams went back and forth as distressing news began to arrive on events inside Poland. Such as on September 3, 1942, Cable by Isaac Sternbuch, which read as follows. According to recently received authentic information, the Germans authorities have evacuated the last ghetto in Warsaw, bestially murdering about 100,000 Jews. Mass murder continues. 
Do whatever you can to cause an American reaction to all these deportations. Do whatever you can to produce such a reaction, stirring up statesmen, the press, and the community." End quote. Similarly, on May 12, 1943, Albert Zilberschein wrote via the Berne legation, quote, based on absolute reliable information, only 10% of the Jewish population in the Gouvernement General, you know, that's the occupied Poland, is still alive. Therefore, I consider it my first duty to organize rescue for the survivors. As part of the action, we are obtaining South American passports, mainly Paraguayan and Honduran ones, from respective consuls friendly to our interest. Zilberschein added, help us expand our, our reach. The lives of the catastrophe survivors depends on that. He furthermore underlined that this action has the full support of the Polish legation in Bern, which has been doing its utmost to help us." End quote. Alexander Wadosh added his own words to this message. He stated, the request has my full and complete support. In June 1944, alarms concerning the situation in Hungary under German control reached the United States. In a cable dated June 3, 1944, a message by Rabbi Freudiger, one of the principal leaders of Jewish Orthodoxy in Hungary, was communicated to New York via the Bern legation. It read, the situation in Hungary has catastrophically worsened. Everywhere ghettos have been established. Deportations are carried out without mercy. The persecutions involve 310,000 Jews. We rely only on you. Everything is in your hand. Do not deliberate too long and do not rest. Awaken all responsible people and act quickly as long as there is still time. The cable by Freudiger was followed with another from Isaac Sternbuch with a request to bomb the railroad junctions through which the deputies transports pass from Hungary to Auschwitz. Isaac Levin of the Agudat Israel, the recipient of these messages via the Polish consulate in New York stated, there is no doubt that the channel via the Polish legation in Switzerland was best because it reached the destination most speedily, most speedily. The Polish envoy, Wadosz, also keeps helping with advice and very valuable aid. Isaac Levine also mentioned that both Consul General in New York, Sylvain Strakacz, and the Polish envoy, Alexander Wadosz in Bern, merited to be inscribed, and he says, in gold letters in the book which records for posterity the attempts at helping the unfortunate victims of Nazis. I was a frequent guest at the consulate with the text of cables which we wanted to send to Europe. Not once was I refused. I felt that I was at home. Isaac Levine. According to David Kranzler, author of Major Jewish Rescuers During the Holocaust, on October 14, 1944, Recha Sternberg wrote to Yaakov Rosenheim, president of Agudat Israel World Organization, that without the help of the Polish ambassador, we could not have saved anyone at all. End quote. Chaim Israel Eis, the other major Jewish rescuer activist in Switzerland, wrote to his Agudat Israel colleague in London, begged Polish government in London to thank the Polish ambassador and consul in Bern for helping me to save Jews." End quote. Indeed, on January 21, 1944, H.A. Goodman, the head of Agudat Israel in London, wrote to K. Kratzkiewicz of the Polish Foreign Office of the most helpful attitude adopted by our minister in Bern, Dr. Wadosz. He has been helpful in every possible direction. And without his assistance, many of the activities which we have undertaken could not have been fulfilled. 
The Jewish Julius Kuhl, who dealt with Polish in the Polish legation as a Wadash's personal representative in relation with Jewish organizations and Polish Jewish refugees in Switzerland, in his post-war memoir, praised Wadash as a real righteous among the nations and a real humanitarian. That he did his utmost to be of service by using all of his influence in the Swiss diplomatic service as well as with the Polish government in exile. For example, Kuhl continued, he made sure to approve all the Polish passport that I made out at the request of the Sternbus and other Jews. He got many reports from Poland about the German atrocities via diplomatic couriers who were not searched even by the Germans. Ambassador Wadosh also approved the use of the secret Polish diplomatic code, which enabled the Sternbus to send or receive messages with no interference from the Allied or the Swiss censors. As to possible threats from the direction of either Germany or the Swiss government, these could not be discounted. Already earlier in May 1940, when the Germans learned of the Swiss intention to nominate Alexander Wadosh as the new chargé d'affaires in place of the departing Titus Kormanitsky, the Swiss ambassador in Berlin, Hans Fröhlicher, was summoned by the German foreign minister Joachim von Rippentrop for a sharp rebuke. Rippentrop threatened that if the Swiss were to approve a new Polish diplomatic envoy, Hitler would recall the German ambassador in Bern. Rippentrop added that he had rarely seen the Führer so upset about this. He claimed that the Polish government in exile was not a truly legitimate government, but a refugee government, since it was devoid of any government rule of its own country. As the response from the Swiss ambassador did not satisfy Germany, the German ambassador, Mr. Kircher, was told to speak with the Swiss president, which took place on May 4, 1940. The German ambassador told the Swiss president bluntly that Germany considered the nomination of a new Polish envoy as an unfriendly act toward Germany, which is a diplomatic term that usually precedes a declaration of war by the affronted party. The shaken Swiss president stated he was surprised by the German position in light of the fact that Germany did not protest the presence of the previous Polish diplomatic representative, but only his replacement. As for the new Polish envoy, it was simply the exchange of one legitimately functioning diplomat with another. Nothing more should be read into this. Busy at the time with the invasion of Norway and soon later of the Low Countries in France, Germany waived any further threats for the moment. To avoid uh, giving Germany an excuse to invade Switzerland, in June 1940, when the Swiss government learned from its police that Albert Stanislas Radziwi, who represented Poland at the League of Nations, together with Kazimierz Trenbitsky, the Polish Consul General in Geneva, that both diplomats had helped five Polish soldiers to flee to France, Trembitsky was expelled from Switzerland, and Wadosh followed this up by closing the Geneva office to conciliate the anger of the Swiss authorities. Three years later, after the Radziwi and Trembitsky affair, the Swiss authorities again considered taking punitive measures, this time against the Swiss legation in Bern. On October 13, 1943, Swiss Foreign Minister Marcel Pilet Golaz summoned Alexander Wadosh for him to explain the Latin American false passport scheme, as recorded by the Swiss Foreign Minister himself. I quote, I point out to him that we found that members of the embassy and consular staff had conducted activity that was beyond the scope of their competence and duties. That is why we intervened. To this, 
Wadosh responded in anger that his government will not be able to accept the Swiss protest. Pile Golas then mentions what Ladosh told him. Or he says, so I asked him what he's going to do. Wadosh replied that a year earlier, the Swiss had changed the status of a certain group of Polish Jews possessing Polish passports to that of stateless, in French, apatride, and thus forced them to leave the country in the direction of Spain and Portugal. Presently, Wadoś continued, the Polish government will never understand that we now treat with absolute severity actions that are very similar, but inspired by very noble reasons. The desire to save the lives of a certain number of, of good people. Moreover, in principle, it was not a case of sending false original Paraguayan passports, but only photocopies of the passports, since the intention was not for the recipients to head to Paraguay, but to use these passports for them to get out of German-occupied countries and avoid deportation to concentration camps. Pile Golas remarked that if the Germans haven't reacted yet, it's because they didn't want to adding, unless they are forced to do so by a scandal for which I can find no justification. To Wadosh's request not to penalize the Polish legation, Pile Golas replied that he wanted first to gather more information on the alleged practice of the Polish legation. Then he added, threateningly, I'll see what to do. Unknown to the Swiss, Several months early on, August 23, 1943, SS officer and infamous Jew hunter, Alois Brunner, in a letter from Paris to SS officer Adolf Eichmann in Berlin, asked for measures to cancel the Latin American passports scheme. Brunner wrote, urgent reference, Jews from the government general in the internment camp of Vitel, near Epinal, France. Most of these Jews have obtained such citizenship through consulates in Switzerland in return for money, although they have not visited their so-called homelands. The names of these persons received the protection of Switzerland as a result of the illegal steps of awarding citizenships via the South American consulate in Switzerland. Warsaw's worst Jewish criminals were able to get out from Warsaw. I ask to verify by a professional person the citizenship validity of the Jews in Vitel camp. Then, in an apparent threat against Switzerland, Alois Brunner added, one must unconditionally tell the Swiss not to allow various Jewish criminals, Jewish criminals, with fraudulently obtained citizenship to be taken out of the Reich. At the same time, independent of the Brunner letter, the Swiss had already considered punitive measures against the Polish legation personnel and the other persons involved in the false passport scheme. On July 21, 1943, the Swiss police noted that Rudolf Hügli had declared that both Stefan Rinievich and Konstantin Rokitsky participated in entering the names on these passports. Several weeks later, on August 9, 1943, the Swiss judge Justice and, Polish, and police minister considered whether to insist that the Polish legation dismiss Rokitsky from his post at the legation. The minister also noted Hugli's claim that Rinievich told him that the fact that Poland and Paraguay were allies should cause Hugli not to deny the Polish request for the passports scheme. The police report therefore concluded that there was no doubt that the Polish legation played a decisive role in the whole fake passport operation. The Swiss minister's recommendation was to ask the Polish legation to dismiss Julius Kuhl and simultaneously force him to leave Switzerland. As for Rinievich and Rukitsky, they were to be summoned and told of the impropriety of the passport scheme and of their personal responsibility in this matter with a warning to cease any further activity of this sort. As for Abraham Zilberschein, on September 1, 1943, he was detained 
and placed under arrest. There are no exact figures how many Jews benefited from the Latin American passport scheme with the aid of the Swiss legation in Berlin. But by all accounts, the figure runs into the thousands. In a major study by Jakob Kumos, uh, the formerly Polish ambassador in Turkey, he has so far identified 3,262 names, of which an estimated 796 survived. However, take into account the family members that were included in many of these passports, the total beneficiary figure runs much higher, perhaps as many as 8,000, of which between two to 3,000 may have survived. Work on this is still in progress, and hopefully we will soon have a more exact tabulation. At the same time, on the basis of all the archival evidence, Swiss official documents and personal testimonies, one may safely draw the following conclusions. One, headed by Alexander Wadosh, the Polish chargé d'affaires, but in truth, having ambassadorial status. The Polish legation in Bern, Switzerland, initiated the vast rescue operation in tandem with several Jewish rescue operatives, mainly by providing thousands of Polish Jews living in countries held by the Germans with fake Latin American passports and citizenship papers. In other words, converting Polish citizens into those of Latin American countries so as to save them from extermination without the official knowledge of these Latin American countries. Number two, in several isolated cases, Polish passports were also issued to non-Polish Jewish citizens to help them leave to safe havens, such as Dr. Josef Burg, a German Jewish citizen, and Pierre Mendes, France, a, Jew, a French Jewish citizen. Number three, in addition, Alexander Wadosh allowed Jewish rescue operatives to transmit vital and urgent messages on the situation of Jews in Nazi-occupied countries to their colleagues in New York via the secret radio station in the Polish legation in Bern, thus helping to launch appeals for vast res rescue undertakings. Number four, Wadosh, Rinievich, and Rokitsky acted on the potential physical danger. Since up to 1943, Switzerland still feared the possibility of a German invasion, given that the country was surrounded on all sides by Axis-controlled countries. In light of this threat, the Swiss even alerted the Polish 2nd Infantry Division of 13,000 soldiers interned in Switzerland to be ready to join in the defense of the country in the event of a German invasion. Alexander Wadish was aware that he and his subordinate diplomats were acting against the laws of the country. As clearly expressed in a face-to-face -face encounter between Wadish with the Swiss foreign minister, Pile Golas. Six, Polish diplomats risked, among others, A, being declared persona non grata, as was the case of the Polish consul in Geneva, Kazimierz Trembitsky in 1940, and B, having the legation closed. The record shows that the Swiss authorities seriously considered the taking of punitive measures. Seven, the reason why the Swiss government finally withheld from such drastic steps may have to do with the changed military situation in October 1943 and thereafter, after the, the devastating German defeat in Stalingrad and North Africa and the fall of the fascist regime in Italy. This may have led the Swiss to conclude that Germany would eventually, and perhaps soon, lose the war so fears of a German invasion of Switzerland was no longer a Damocles sword hanging over the head of the country, as was the case up till then. And it was better to send signals of a Swiss neutrality that was bending closer toward the Allies. As evidenced by a police report of May 10, 1940, written 
in a subtle diplomatic language, and I quote, the government authorities have, in light of the current international situation, all the grounds to avoid any occasions that would lead to a discussion of the status of a legation of an occupied country, end quote. But this, of course, could not have been foreseen or foreknown by the Polish legation personnel when they acted under the potential threat of the previously mentioned punitive measures. Number eight, furthermore, if Konstanty Rokitsky had been justifiably declared a righteous among the nations by Yad Vashem, then certainly, based on incontrovertibly credible evidence, as outlined above, that this title belongs even more strongly to Rokitsky's superiors, to Alexander Wadosh, the man in charge of the Polish legation in Bern, and his immediate close aide, Stefan Rinievich. It is well to remember that Yad Vashem awarded the righteous title to the El Salvador Consul General in Geneva, Arturo Costellanos, and I was involved in that process, for permitting his Jewish legation secretary, George Mandel Mantello, to issue Salvadoran citizenships to thousands of Jews in Hungary and other countries. This precedent similarly applies in the case of Alexander Wadosh and his principal aide, Stefan Rinievich both of whom are mentioned in the testimonies and Swiss reports as being actively involved in the various rescue operations. As for Julius Kuhl, the Jewish staff on the Polish legation, he too deserves to be acknowledged. For him, under the program of the B'nai B'rit organization of honoring major Jewish rescuers. Nine, in conclusion, this is probably the only recorded story to emerge from the Holocaust of a close an intimate collaboration between Polish diplomats, mainly in Switzerland, but also in other countries, and Jewish rescue activists, which led to a major effort undertaken to rescue as many Polish Jews as possible. While not all recipients of these false passports were able to save themselves, as Germany eventually questioned the validity of these passports, and the persons possessing them were deported to death camps Many others, numbering at least a thousand, and perhaps even more, succeeded in saving themselves. Ten, in conclusion, the story of the Waters Group, of their superhuman efforts, in this vast and unique rescue operation, needs to be acknowledged, praised, and universally known as an example of one of the highest levels of humanitarian responses against the forces of darkness. I want to thank Jakob Kumoc, Jens Oshinsky, and Markus Blechnow for having helped me in collecting a great part of the evidence in this story. Thank you all. Dr. Peldiel, I'd like to say thank you so much. That was so enlightening and so informative. I would like to open up the floor to any questions, but also to remind people on Zoom that you can ask a question. Uh, I'll be able to see the questions here pop up in the chat. Um, are there any questions at all? I think I'll kick off with a question, actually. I have one. Um, do you think that we could have stopped um, the murders in Auschwitz, especially for the Hungarian Jews, if the Allies had bombed the tracks as, as, as they wanted to? Yes, of course. If the Allies had bombed, not necessarily Auschwitz, but the railway track that led into Auschwitz, because what was the Holocaust? The Holocaust can be divided into two main uh, categories. Holocaust by bullets, by the Einsatzgruppen, by collaborators in the former, uh, po uh, in, uh, in the Polish territories held by the Soviet Union and in Russia and so on. Holocaust by bullets, like Babi Yar. I have to mention Katyn, but this is a different story. And 
Holocaust by gas chambers. The Holocaust by gas chambers went by trains. All the Jews who came to Auschwitz, to Treblinka, to Sobibor, to Belgius, uh, to Chalno, they came by train or by transportation. So if you bomb the tracks that lead to these camps, you can stop the gassing of many people. It takes time to fix and correct and so on. None of these railway tracks leading into Treblinka, Sobibor and others, and Auschwitz, were ever bombed. Whereas the Allies, who had control of the airspace of Europe, starting in 1943, were bombing continuously railway tracks leading to military installations, to factories and workshops. In fact, American and British planes were flying over Auschwitz uh, to bomb installations uh, producing uh, uh, fake tires and substitute oil just a few kilometers away from Auschwitz. And they even took snapshots of uh, Auschwitz as they passed over Auschwitz. They didn't know what it was. So it was, possible, it was possible to do something. The Allies didn't do anything, and the SS were laughing at the Jewish prisoners, saying, you see, your own people, they don't care what's happening here. In other words, they approve it. That, that, that was a great mistake by the Allied governments. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Director. Uh, question, will it be in Polish or English? It's going to be in English. Well, I was... Since I'm a speaker, I delivered this speech in English, so I'll ask the question also in English. Um, you have been describing and identifying the the, the ways that the Wadish group operated and carried out all this rescue mission. But I'm wondering whether we can just, I don't know, make a step up and see broadly the rescue efforts by the diplomats. Do you think there are some common denomination or the common traces that we can say that if we talk about diplomatic rescue, this happens, that happens, the other things happen, and there is a so, there, is there any specific characteristics that we can lay out as a diplomatic rescue effort outside of the, of the Wadish group? Do you think there is anything that gets in common that we can talk, if you want to write a book about diplomatic rescue efforts during the Second World War, what would be the, the main categories, what would be the main issues that you would raise here? Very good question. First, I want to say the difference between the perpetrators and the rescuers. The perpetrators, they acted as the groups of people. What they were doing, they knew others were also doing. The rescuers, they all asked, acted by themselves. Wadosh didn't know about the other diplomats. Karl Lutz didn't know about Wadosh. You may never have heard of him. It was a lonely individual thing. Now, all the diplomats, the beautiful thing about the diplomats is they had much leeway to interpret the instructions that they got from their governments. They could finagle, as we say. Uh, Raoul Wallenberg could say, these people, they have relatives in Sweden and they are about to go to Sweden, which was false. And therefore, I would give them Schutzpass, uh, protective letters. They could do that. There was a, form, a small form of legality. The only case where a diplomat acted, which was without any excuse of legality, was Alexander Wadoš. Imagine a Polish ambassador sitting in London, issuing fake passports of uh, Canada to someone. Unheard of. No excuse, no justification, no alibi. Uh, but he did it because he felt that the Polish government in London would agree to what he was doing post factum. The Polish government in London could not tell Wadoš, go ahead and do it, it's okay, go ahead. Because the Polish government in, Lo in London had diplomatic relations with Paraguay, with Honduras, and this, so they, they couldn't expose themselves. So Wadosh had to take all the responsibility upon himself. So 
You're asking about what is uh, the common denominator of all the diplomats. What is the common denominator of all the rescuers? Not only diplomats. Jankowski, Irena Sendlerova. We're talking about human nature at a very deep level. This is something we, we still don't know much. We know a lot about the moon, about Mars, and about flying, but we, we still don't know about ourselves, everything. Most of the people who helped, they say, it was a natural thing, we, we simply had to do it. I worked at Yad Vashem for 24 years, and I studied thousands of cases. There is not one case where a rescuer, when he was asked after the war, why did you risk your life to help? Not one of them said, it's because I read the philosophy of uh, Immanuel Kant and Jean-Jacques uh, Rousseau, and I was influenced by uh, the philosophy of this. They didn't say that. They said it was a natural thing. They came and asked for help, and I'm a human being, and I decided I'm going to make an effort because I think the major thing here, of course, uh, there were some people who gave religious explanations, like I'm a Christian, and my duty is to help others in need. There were also these. But I think the major thing here, what happened during the Holocaust, and incidentally, many of the people who aided Jews, it's not because they love Jews. It doesn't have to do necessarily with anti-Semitism or philo-Semitism. There were rescuers who, they had prejudices against the Jews. Maybe you've heard of Sofia Kosak Stutska. She was known as an anti-Semite, but she created Jigota. So th the thing about the rescuer during the Holocaust, in my opinion, and people may dispute with me, we are in a situation where there is a government in a country considered civilized who has taken the authority to decide who is allowed to live on planet Earth and who is not allowed to live because they were born, not because they committed anything. And they decided that the Jewish people has no right to exist. Now, this never happened before. In all the conflicts and persecutions, which was based on political things, on ethnic, but never because these people have no right to exist because they were born. In fact, as you probably know, in Poland, many Polish people felt that they were next in line after the Jews. I have seen documents from the Polish underground, from the army Krajowa, to say, after the Germans have finished with the Jews, it's our turn maybe. They'll want to finish with us because they knew that Germany wanted to annex Poland and colonize it. And therefore, when this happened, we will stage the revolt against the Germans ahead of the planned revolt. And so in a situation like this, when you feel that the Jew has no right to live, not because of anything he did, because he was born, then you ask yourself, maybe I am next in line, who knows? And therefore I must do something. I have to get involved if the Jews come and ask for my help, because this is an unprecedented situation. I'll give you an example of this. In France, when France was occupied by the Germans, the French issued a law against the Jews, the Vichy government, in 1940. Nobody in France protested. The laws against the Jews stated that Jews could not hold certain jobs and this and that, discrimination. It seems that most agreed that Jews should be second-class citizens in France, okay. But in 1942, when the deportation started in France, then there was an upswing of protest by, by Catholic cardinals and so forth deporting men, women, and children on a train to Poland. In other words, this is the red line. And I think uh, people like uh, Radosh and the other diplomats understood that a red line had been crossed, which never happened before in history. And they as diplomats, if they could do something semi-legally, reinterpret the instructions from above and do something to save these people, because they have a right to live, then they would do it. It's something human. It's something of human nature, perhaps.
Some sociologists and psychiatrists have written uh, studies and they say it's because of their family upbringing, of their background, they had tolerant parents, and they, they had liberal views of people and so forth. So I don't know whether this applies to all the rescuers and all the diplomats. I don't know whether Alexander Wawosh was a liberal. I don't know what his politics was. I know he was anti-communist because after the war he, he did not return to Poland. But uh, he went to France and uh, he did certain things which got him in trouble with the French government, uh, monetary things and so on, after the war. So I don't know whether Radosh, when he decided with his fake passport, it's because of uh, his liberal views. I don't even know that he was a liberal, but he was a humanitarian. And I think that there are many people who can be humanitarians when the situation arises. But again, I warn you, the Holocaust was something which never happened before and hopefully will never happen again. Of a government deciding who has a right to live and who does not have a right to live on this planet. Not because of anything they did, but of being born. It went so far that even Jews who were no longer Jews, but they were Catholics, they had converted. Do you know that in the Warsaw Ghetto, you probably know, there was a section that was together for baptized Jews. They had churches and they stated, we're no longer Jews. We converted, our, our parents converted, but the Nazi says, you have Jewish blood. You go to Treblinka. So this thing never happened before. So I think the diplomats realized that if they could save a handful and more, and they started by, I don't think that Wadosh said, I'm gonna save 8,000 Jews, no. I'm going to start by issuing, I think we're going to issue false passports and we're going to go ahead and ahead and see how far we can go. One step leads to the other step in goodness as one step leads to the other step in badness. This is as far as I can give my opinion. Do we have any more questions? I, I do have one more. Only because um, at the moment, obviously, you're speaking about the subject, you're speaking about Alexander Wadosh and what they did. What can we in this room right now do to get this story out into the mainstream public so people really know about what happened? Well, the very fact that here the Pilevsky Institute is creating today officially the Wadosh uh, group, and this will be publicized in the press, in the media, and it, it will be learned in Israel. So, again, this has nothing to do with Polish-Jewish relations during the war. This has nothing to do with Israel-Polish relations today. It has to do with Mr. Alexander Wadosh and Rinievich and Rukitsky. It has to do with these three persons, where, whether they deserve to be honored by the institution of Yad Vashem which I'm very proud to have worked there for so many years. And that has created the program for honoring non-Jews, for saving Jews. This is the issue which I hope that thanks to this conference and thanks to the story being told and retold in the Israeli media, uh, will result in Wadash and Rinievich also to be added to the ranks of the righteous by Yad Vashem and hopefully, hopefully, Someone in Hollywood will create, will write a script to make a movie out of this. It deserves a movie. There's a lot of drama there. There's a lot of drama. And it, it could be as good a movie as uh, Spielberg's movie of uh, Oskar Schindler. And speaking of Oskar Schindler, you know he was not a great humanitarian before that. He was a spy for the Abwehr. He was a ladies' man. He didn't care about people. He only cared about himself. He only cared about himself. He was a hedonist. He was a playboy. And then he came to Poland. And he got the company there. Emil, it was called Record. And then he called it Emile Fabrik. And he had these workers. And he felt these workers have a right to live. He himself was a member of the Nazi party. Although he was not really a Nazi, but he was a member of the Nazi party. 
And he became one of the largest rescuers of Jews, over 1,000 Jews. It's the situation that makes a person a humanitarian. Although if you looked at the past of uh, Oskar Schindler, you said this man will never help anyone else. He would only help himself. So we still don't know everything about motivations and what caused people. But the very fact that we don't know, that's a good sign. That means if they could do it, then maybe we all can do something, a good thing. So we don't have to be Alexander Waters. We don't have to issue fake passports or fake identity cards. Under normal conditions, certainly not. But under abnormal conditions, where the universal laws of humanity and decency are threatened, uh, unorthodox methods may be permitted. We have about three minutes. Popolsko Frank Chapangelsko. Uh, thank you. I am Melada Polishinska from Prague, and I have a question whether during uh, your research on Ladoš uh, group, you came across the name of Jaromir Kopecki. He was a Czechoslovak um, diplomat in, in Bern who, uh, who in, to some extent, had similar situation as Ladoš because he was or Polish, Polish, uh, Polish diplomats, because after occupation of Czech lands, he did not uh, transfer the legation into the hands of uh, Germans as he was ordered, and he stayed on his position, and uh, then reported to uh, Czechoslovak government in exile in London, and he also was involved in transferring information about uh, Jews and about, uh, about the situation in uh, Slovakia and in protectorate Bohemia and Moravia. Uh, Kopecki. Kopec Kopecki. I, I would wonder if you came across this name. Uh, he was in Bern. In Bern? Mm -hmm. Kopecki in Bern? Yes. In the Polish legation? No, Czechoslovak. Ah, the Czech legation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have not heard, but we have honored a, a Czech diplomat who was stationed in Vichy, France, and he gave uh, Czech passports uh, to um, an American by the name of Varian Fry who then uh, gave them to people so they could leave France and go to Spain and Portugal. But that's a whole different story. But I haven't heard of Kopetsky. And that's no surprise. Two years ago, if you had come to me and said, have you heard of Alexander Wadosh? I would have said no. And I worked at Yad Vashem 24 years, and then I talked about it in the research. Never heard of Alexander Wadosh. Nobody mentioned his name. So maybe there are some, I'm sure there are some more names that we don't know and will come up. Next year, two years, three years. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you so much, Dr. Paldel, for this absolutely enlightening talk. Thank you.